Hi, I'm Alistair, I'm a games designer, and in this video I'd like to demonstrate this escape room puzzle to you. So players come across seven stone discs that have got various coloured symbols around the outside, and they're given the instruction that toppling symbols must match. Here is a key that is secured to a maglock that will release when the puzzle is correctly solved. So players will realise that the discs rotate, and what they need to do is to rotate them all so that the symbols on toppling edges are the same as the instructions describe. Now, if you'd like to try to solve this puzzle yourself, you can pause the video at this point and see if you can work it out. Otherwise, I will tell you how to approach it. Now, as it turns out, if you just approach this puzzle by trial and error, it could take you quite a long time to solve. So for example, we've got the matching green reeds here. So we could go around to the next wheel and say, well, now we've got to match the white person. And then we've got the green reeds here. And then we try to arrange the middle wheel uh, so let's make it match on this edge, but this side here is broken and there's no way that we can get this combination of symbols to line up and for this match here to be correct. And what that tells us is that the uh, matching edge between the centre and this wheel must be something other than the Eye of Horus. So we can literally go around and try every uh, symbol in turn at a given edge. Uh, so let's say it was the reeds instead. Well, already we see that this edge is broken because we can't have the reeds and the beetle and then it matches here. So there's actually only six possible patterns you need to try, which is matching a given wheel and the centre wheel on one edge. And if you keep on trying that, what you'll find out is the solution and the only possible solution to this particular configuration is to set the wheels like this. And when I spin this last wheel into position here, which will be the water against the water, the eye and the eye of the two reeds, what should happen is that the key releases and the puzzle is solved. Now I'm gonna tell you how I made this puzzle and explain how you can create it yourself. Okay, so I designed the overall layout of the puzzle in Inkscape. And Inkscape is a fantastic free open source graphics editor. And you can see it's got a range of common drawing tools here on the left hand side. But what makes it great is its ability to use extensions. So an extension is a script that adds uh, extra functionality or automation. And to create these symbol wheels, I'm going to go to the render menu and select the polar grid. Now it may not be obvious at first how a grid is going to help us make a wheel, but if I click on the live preview button at the bottom here, you'll see that this extension creates a circular grid using polar coordinates, and it's based on the parameters defined in this window. So to create our stone disk, I'm going to modify the number of angle divisions. I only want to have six around the outside of the disk, and I don't really need any divisions in the center at all, so I'm just going to reduce that down to one and then if we go to the circular divisions tab um, I really just need two divisions here um, because what I want is to have an inside area and an outside area um, and you'll see that there's lots of other options that we could set but I think that's probably all we need for this example um, so I'm going to click apply and then close and here's our disk so I'm just going to delete uh, that line in the middle don't really need that then I'm going to drag and group the elements together and then I'm going to resize it. So I want a, a 20 centimeter large disc. I'm set it at 200 millimeters. There we go. And just drag that up here. And then I'm going to uh, control C to copy it and I'm just going to paste uh, some more discs next to it and lay them out. And because I've got the uh, snapping option available here, laying these out should be really straightforward because you see they literally snap next to each other. They line up uh, the nodes that correspond on each wheel next to each other. That's going to make this layout really simple. Uh, like that, that's our seven disks. Uh, now I'm just going to go File, Document Properties, Resize to Drawing or Selection. That's going to frame our page around our seven disks. Uh, there we go. Now, you might notice this isn't quite right yet, though, because the segment here is not 
lining up for a segment of the wheel below it. Actually, what's happening, the lines between segments are lining up. So I need to rotate each disc uh, just to make the segments like that line up. So I'm just going to hold down control as I rotate them. And that's just going to enable me to rotate each of these discs. So we now see these two segments line up, these segments and these segments. So I'm just going to do that on every disc. Uh, so I've done the top ones and then this last one at the bottom right and then the bottom left. Okay, great. So now we have our wheels laid out and they're all correctly lining up. We need to add some symbols into each of those segments to match up. Now I could use um, alchemical symbols, I could use runes, I could use Greek letters, but I'm going to use hieroglyphs and I want to explain why. Uh, so first of all I'm going to go to the text uh, tool. I'm just going to type a letter. Um, and obviously I could just line up normal letters. I could have the letter A here and letter A on matching symbol. But one thing I literally just discovered is that hieroglyphs are actually part of the Unicode character set. So rather than having the letter A, if I press Control u and type a Unicode code like 13000, and then hit enter, I can actually insert a hieroglyph into a text box. I don't need to download any special fonts, I don't need to download any graphics or anything like that. I can literally do that just using a uh, text icon. So again, I could do control U, type a different Unicode code, uh, 13020 for example, and we get a different Egyptian hieroglyph. And I just thought this was so neat that you could actually insert uh, pictorial symbols just using a text tool with no uh, extra um, kind of assets at all. So that's why I uh, decided to go for hieroglyphs. In fact, if you go to the Wikipedia page about hieroglyphs, you'll see that it lists the Unicode codes corresponding to all sorts of hieroglyphs. So we've got people, we've got animals and nature, uh, we've got uh, buildings and sort of abstract symbols. So uh, all of these symbols are available, like I say, just from a standard character set in Windows. You don't need to download anything extra at all. Uh, so if I take uh, this little uh, hornet or mosquito or something, I can actually copy and paste that in there and we've got a whole other symbol. So let's drag that to this wheel over here and we've got a matching symbol there and, you know, we could we could carry this on. And to create the solution to the puzzle, this is really straightforward now because all we can do is we can ensure that we have matching symbols on any two edges where circles touch. So these ones match and we make these ones match. And if we carry on building this up, we are guaranteed to create a solution to uh, the puzzle. But actually we want to go a little bit further than that. What we want to do is we want to ensure that there is only one unique solution to the puzzle. And to do that, we're going to use another tool, which is called MiniZinc. So MiniZinc, like Inkscape, is open source and you can download it for free. And it's a program for modeling and solving constraint satisfaction problems. Now, normally those problems have some kind of industrial application, but it's also great for creating and testing logic puzzles. And it's a really useful tool if you're interested in creating those kind of puzzles for escape rooms or puzzle hunts or things like that. I've been using it in a lot of my recent projects and I really like it. So here's the code I wrote to model this particular puzzle. And I can't explain all the features of MiniZinc in this video, but I'll step through it and try to explain how it works. You can see it looks a little bit like Arduino code. Um, so at the top here, we've got uh, an enumeration called symbols, and that just contains these six different color names here. So these are going to be the different symbols that are referred to throughout the code. And I've just given them colors because I thought that was easier to refer to them rather than the hieroglyphs I'm using. So I don't have to type, you know, man sitting down pointing out finger or eagle sitting on branch or something. But these could really be anything you want. They just need to be a unique name that we're going to use to refer to the symbols on each wheel. 
And then we define an integer called num symbols, and that's going to be six. So that's the number of symbols taken from this set here, which are going to appear on each wheel. And then what we do is we actually define the order uh, that these symbols appear on each wheel. So um, we've got wheels one to seven, and each one of those is going to be defined as an array with six elements in it taken from the members of the set of symbols. And they're going to have those symbols in a different order in each case. So we're always starting with white, but you'll see after that that the different elements differ. And if you refer back to the beginning of this video, you'll see that these are actually the uh, order in which the symbols appear on each of my wheels. I've started from the white one here and then I'm going clockwise around the wheel. Um, and all of these uh, variables so far, so this is what MiniZinc calls parameters and they're a little bit equivalent to constants in Arduino code. So these are just things that we're telling the uh, modeling engine are not going to change. These are just the uh, parameters that apply to the problem. And now this next one here, you'll see a slightly different syntax. Rather than having an array of symbols, we've got an array of var, and we are saying that there are going to be seven elements in this array, and each one of them is going to be a value somewhere between one and six. And this is what's called a decision variable. So unlike a variable in Arduino code, which is something that uh, can be changed based on the value of some input or calculated as a result of some code, code or something, um, a decision variable is the output of this program that meets the constraints that we define. And what we want to know is uh, sort of what angle does each wheel need to be rotated to so that all the symbols match. Now we don't actually need to know an angle as such, all we need to know is which of the six symbols on the disk is pointing upwards. So I've called it wheel rotations and it's going to be a number between one and six for each of the disks and that's going to tell us uh, how they have to be positioned so that all the symbols match. Okay, so that's a decision variable. We've got parameters. And the next most important thing is the constraints, because this is where we actually give the uh, program the rules that need to be met to try to work out the answer here. Now, this may look uh, a little bit complicated, this section, but it's actually not too hard if I refer to a diagram of how the wheels are actually positioned. So if I just uh, load that diagram up in Inkscape and move it to the side, so hopefully you can see that. So I've numbered the wheels, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, with seven in the middle and one at the top. And I've also numbered the segments on each wheel going round one to six. Uh, so this is exactly as I referred to them in the parameters up here. And it's also how we're going to define the constraints here. So each wheel around the outside has two constraints on it because going clockwise, the segment here needs to match the segment uh, of its immediate neighbour and the segment here needs to match the corresponding segment in the middle. If we go all the way around the outside, you'll see that the section 2 in disk 6 needs to match section 5 in disk 1. So each one only needs to look one way around the uh, the outside, and then to the middle. And that's how we've defined the constraints here. So the first set of constraints, this is all ensuring that the uh, symbol that is touching the centre wheel matches the symbol that's here. So wheel one, which is the wheel at the top, we want to have a rotation that when whichever symbol is facing the top, because that's what wheel rotation is going to give us, when we add on three more symbols to that, one, two, three, that symbol there is going to be equal to the symbol on wheel seven when it has not been rotated at all. That's why we've got the plus zero there. So that's 
basically the way in uh, in this code of how we define that we want this symbol in this segment of disk 1 to match this symbol in this segment of disk 7. And next line down does it the same for wheel 2. So we say whatever rotation wheel 2 is in, that's what real rotations 2 gives us, so that's this segment at the top. If we add on 4 to that, going clockwise, 1, 2, 3, 4, we get to this segment here, and that needs to be equal to the wheel 7 rotation plus 1, because that's going to give us here. And we continue this all the way down so that all of the 6 wheels around the outside, when we uh, take the relevant segment relative to the segment that's at the top, and we line it up next to the segment of wheel 7 that's in the opposite position of the wheel, then they need to be equal. That's our first set of constraints. And the next set of constraints are really very similar, except this time we're just looking at uh, the segments of each wheel relative to their neighbour. So wheel 1, whatever the rotation is of the symbol at the top, and then we add on 2, 1, 2, we get to this segment here, and that needs to be equal to the rotation of disk 2 plus 5. So we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And again, we know that these two symbols therefore have to match. You'll notice that we don't need to actually explicitly define any constraints on wheel 7 itself um, because that is kind of done for us by virtue of the, um, the pairing nature of the constraints here. If uh, the wheel rotation of wheel 1 plus 3 is equal to wheel 7 plus 0. We don't need to define it the other way around as well because they have to match. Um, so hopefully that made sense. Those are the constraints. So we've got our parameters which define the constants which are not going to change. We've got our decision variable which is what we want the code to tell us. And then we have the constraints which the decision has to be subject to. And then we call the solve method and we ask it to find any solutions that satisfy. We're not trying to uh, get an optimal solution to this problem, we're literally trying to find any solution to this problem. And uh, it's worth mentioning out that the uh, on the configuration for the solver here you'll see that it is possible to stop after a certain number of solutions have been found. So for example if I just wanted to know is this puzzle solvable I could stop it after the first solution had been found. But in this case, I don't just want to know is it solvable. Um, I know that already because I designed it in Inkscape. What I want to make sure is that there is only one solution. So I'm going to uncheck that and then it will list all of the possible solutions to the problem. I want to make sure there's only one of them given. And finally, we are just going to uh, format the output a little bit. So the output here, this is a little bit like uh, serial.print, for example, in Arduino speak. Uh, we're going to just put a bit of text and we are going to print that wheel rotations for each of the wheels. So we're going to go through that array and we're going to just put where they are, top, top right, bottom, bottom left, etc. The reason for the modulo here is because the wheel might have been rotated all the way round more than once. Um, but we only need to you know, rotate it. The, the maximum amount we'll possibly need to rotate it is one complete revolution, and then we're back to the beginning. OK, so that's the, uh, that's the code. Um, and I simply hit the Run button here. And very quickly, you'll see in 0.1 of a second, we've got some results. And fantastically, we have only got one result. And it tells us the solution here, the symbol pointing upwards on each wheel in the solution position, is yellow for wheel one at the top, white, yellow, yellow, blue, black, and the middle wheel has green facing up. So now we've confirmed the layout and design of the puzzle that leads to a unique solution. Let me tell you more about how I actually went about building the elements here. Um, so if I just pop one of these wheels off to show you, I'll take this bottom off. So this is uh, simply a piece of uh, 9mm MDF, you can see on the back there. And what I did is I uh, spray painted it with some textured spray paint to give it this stone effect. And then I actually used a router just to 
give it a bit of texture and to route out the different segments here, but you really don't need to do that. That's purely aesthetic. And then if you wanted to, um, I painted on the symbols here because I think that sort of lent itself well to the theme, but you could laser engrave them, you could route those out as well. And we know which symbols to place on which wheel from the output from our MiniZinc code. And make sure that you number your wheels as well. So I've numbered this one number four, just so that I know uh, whereabouts in the board it needs to be inserted to make sure that the solution still works. In terms of mounting it, I've just gone for a, a single bolt, which I've put through the centre of each disc here. Um, you could instead, if you prefer, uh, mount each wheel on one of these. This is a mechanism for a Lazy Susan. Um, these are very easy and cheap to buy, and you could have inserted that around uh, the wheel like that, and that would actually be more suitable if you had a higher load to bear. So let's say you made you know, substantially larger discs that you wanted to rotate freely. Um, that would be a better choice for actually being a, a load-bearing mechanism rather than uh, just applying it on a single spindle. And obviously you could design this to be a vertical or horizontal as well. Each would work um, equally well. The next thing to think about is actually how do we detect when the puzzle is solved then? Um, and for that you'll notice that I've also inserted in the underside here, a small neodymium magnet. Now, remember that the output from the MiniZinc program told us the symbol that was going to be facing up on each of the wheels when the puzzle is solved. So this last wheel that I've taken out here um, will be that way up when the puzzle is solved. In fact, I can prove that to you if I just slide back in. There goes the key again. So on the reverse of this wheel here, you'll see if I keep it the same way up, you'll see I've got the magnet on this one here is lined up on the axis that will have the correct symbol facing upwards. And on the backboard here, what I've got is I've got a small hall, uh, a reed switch, sorry. So a small magnetic sensor that is going to detect when that magnet is uh, correctly rotated over there. Now I've positioned this magnet uh, about three centimetres away from the centre point and that's what I found to give the best sensitivity. The further towards the outside of the wheel you place it then you're going to have to have the wheel very precisely in the right position because only a small rotation of the wheel would move the magnet quite far away from the centre. Uh, from the sensor. Conversely, if you have it very close to the sensor, what happens is you could have actually rotated the wheel, you know, 90 degrees or further, and it will still be close enough for the sensor to detect it. So this is something you're going to have to try a little bit from trial and error. It will depend on the strength of the magnets you'll use. It will depend on the sensitivity of the sensors you're using somewhat. But if you're using the same as me, and I'll put a link uh, in the description to exactly which units I'm using, I found a distance of about three centimetres meant that, I will try to demonstrate this to you, so um, it will, and let me put the key back on, so I need to move it further out of alignment there to send it off and the key is activated. So I've got the wrong symbol showing at the moment, I can rotate it all the way around here, this is still the wrong symbol, and then just at the point where this symbol starts to be more lined up with here than it is with here, you'll see that's the point that the sensor activates with the magnet and the solution is regarded as, as being complete and that's when the key releases. And this is what the reverse of the board looks like. So we've got each of the seven bolts coming through here onto which the wheels are mounted and then just above each of them we've got this white magnet sensor and that's what's going to detect whether each wheel has been positioned with the correct symbol pointing upwards. Those sensors have got uh, two wires coming out of them. One wire from each sensor is going to this eight-way Wago connector block here, and that's got another wire which is connected to the Arduino ground pin at the bottom. So they've all got one wire connected to a common ground, and then the other wire goes to a unique GPIO pin from two to eight. So we've got the wheel at the top is using GPIO pin 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8 in the middle. 
Then on the top side of the board here, we've got a relay module. This is a five volt relay module that's going to be controlling power to the mag lock and releasing the key when the puzzle is complete. And that's connected to ground to five volt and I'm using pin A5 to trigger the relay here. Now, it would be possible to simplify the wiring here. We could actually connect all of the uh, sensors in series in a single loop and have that connected directly as a trigger into the relay module, doing away with the Arduino altogether, in fact. But the reason I prefer to use this design is firstly, we get to monitor individually which of the wheels is in the correct position. And that's really useful, especially when you're first configuring and debugging the project. If maybe there's one wheel that hasn't quite had the magnet set at the right position, you'll notice that that is the one that isn't triggering correctly. Whereas if they're all connected in a loop, there's no way of individually identifying uh, which one is not positioned right or not. And the second reason is it allows additional program logic to be added to the Nano. So let's say we wanted to add a sound effect when the puzzle was completed. Let's say we wanted to integrate with some sort of game control software that allows us to override the puzzle or to monitor the current status remotely, for example. All of that can very easily be added to a Nano and it's really not that much more complicated to do than the original design. So Nanos are so cheap and easy to wire, I tend to include them in all my uh, props, even when, strictly speaking, they're not required. And here's just a fritzing illustration of the same wiring. Um, I'm not sure if this is much clearer, to be honest, um, but hopefully you can make out here we've got our array of seven magnet sensors in a circle, and they all share a common ground. That's these black lines here, which is going to the Arduino ground. And then the other side of each of those sensors is connected to uh, GPIO pins 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8. And then on this side of the Nano here we've got a 5 volt relay module that's connected to ground and 5 volts and the signal line here is connected to pin A5. Then on the load side of the relay we've got a 12 volt DC supply that's powering the mag lock and that's going between the common and normally closed terminals of the relay. Um, so what we need to look at now is the code that's running on the Nano itself and that's going to be responsible for monitoring the status of all of these sensors and when they are all activated by the presence of a magnet that means that the wheels on the front of the board must be positioned in the correct location. That means we can send a signal down this A5 pin which will trigger the relay that's going to switch the common pin across here and that's going to de-energize the mag lock releasing the key. And here is that code. Um, so it's not very long and it's relatively straightforward so we'll just uh, step through it together. Um, so we start at the beginning with the constants. So these are defining the parameters of the puzzle. So we're going to use seven sensors, one for each of the wheels on the front and those sensors are going to be wired into GPIO pins 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8. And then we have the relay pin which is what we're going to use to send our output trigger wired into pin A5. Now there's nothing special about uh, the pins which I'm using here so if you want to assign different pins here uh, or if you want to increase or decrease the number of sensors in your puzzle that's fine you can just change these values to something else uh, as you want. And then we go on to the global section. So I've got a single global variable here and it's an array of byte values um, and it's got one element for each sensor. So in this case this is going to be an array containing seven elements and what we're going to use this for is to keep track of what the last measured value of each sensor was and then if we take a new reading and we find that it differs from the one that was in this array we know that uh, one of the wheels has been rotated and it's now either lined up when it wasn't before or now it's not lined up when it was before and that means that we can check whether the uh, puzzle has been solved and whether we need to trigger the relay or not. So this is kind of like keeping a, a last known state of each of the uh, sensors up here. We go into the setup function, so this gets executed once when the program first begins. I'm creating a serial connection um, 
This isn't actually required for the puzzle at all, um, but it's always quite useful for debugging purposes to have a serial connection. It just means you can log any values back and view them on your PC using the Arduino serial monitor. Uh, so we'll create a serial connection and we'll just print the file name and the date when this code was last compiled as well. And we initialize the pins we're going to use. So we're going to loop over the sensor pins array that we defined up here. So um, these are the pins we're using for the sensors. We're going to loop over each one up to the number of sensors and we're going to define these all as input pull-ups. So uh, that will pull up the value read on each of these pins up to a high value unless they are activated by a mag lock, uh, a magnet sorry and when the magnet touches them they're going to pull them down to that ground connection that I showed you in the wiring diagram and then they will read a low value instead. Um, we'll also initialize the output pin so that's the relay pin we've got up here and initially we will write a low value to that. Depending on the configuration of the relay module you're using you might have an active high or an active low relay. Um, I'm using here I'm writing a low value initially and I'm going to write a high value when the puzzle is solved. It might be that your relay is configured the other way around in which case you simply swap this for high and a bit later on in the code you'll need a high that you swap to a low. Uh, I've got a little function here called print state and again this is purely used for debugging purposes um, just to you know when you're configuring remember I described uh, the distance that you want to position the magnet away from the center of each wheel so that it triggers you know with the correct sensitivity um, and this is an example of uh, where this function would come in really useful because you want to move the wheels round and you want to print onto the serial monitor exactly the point at which each of the sensors gets activated um, and that's what we're doing here um, so we're going to loop over all the sensors we're going to print what the last known state of each of them was and then here we're just going to format it a little bit pretty by uh, putting a semicolon in between each value but the last and then we'll just put a carriage return at the end so all this is going to do is just going to spit out to the Arduino serial monitor uh, what the values are and like I say that will be useful when we're trying to tune the sensitivity of all those magnets and check the position of the sensors. And then we go on to the loop function. So this is the main program loop that just goes round and round for as long as the uh, code is running. And what we're going to do is we'll define two boolean variables at the top. First of all we're going to say whether any of the sensor values has changed since the last time that loop ran and secondly we're going to uh, have a variable that tells us whether all the wheels are correct or not. Now notice that we assume the default value if, if anything has changed we're going to say is false but we'll assume that they are all correct. Now this is a kind of a pattern which I've used in lots of code before. It might seem a little bit odd while you do it like that. Why would you assume they're all correct? Well because what we're going to do here is we're going to loop over all of the sensors. We're going to read what the current state of each of them is and we're going to compare them to their last known state. If it's different from their last known state, so that's what exclamation mark equals mean, that means different from then we're going to know they're changed. But if any single sensor that we read the value of reads zero, then we know that they cannot all be correct. So, and from that point onwards, it doesn't actually matter whether any other sensors are correct or not. As soon as we get to one that is not right, we know that this can be false. If we were set this up the other way around, if we made a boolean all correct equals false by default, what we'd have to do is to loop through all of them and ensure that every single one of the sensors was correct in order to set it to true. It's the difference between whether all of them are true or whether any of them are false, which logically is the same thing, but from a code point of view, it's much quicker to check if any of them are false. 
So I hope that kind of made sense. It wasn't hugely well explained. But this is the reason why we initialize this one to false, but we initialize this one to true. Um, and then, like I say, I've kind of accidentally gone through all what we're doing here already. So we're going to loop over all of them, take the current value, and then we're going to do our two tests for our, our two Boolean variables here. First of all, is it different to the value we last knew about for this sensor? If it is, then has changed is true. And we'll update uh, our array that keeps track of the last known state. Secondly, we'll test whether it's correct or not. And if any of the sensors that we come across while we're looping over them, if any of them are zero, then we know that not all the sensors are correct. So we can set that to be false. So let's say all correct is the same as any incorrect. Um, and that's the way we set up the test. Uh, when we get to the end of that loop, so we've, we've updated all the values, if any of them have changed, then we'll call that print state function, which we had up here. And that will just dump an output to the serial monitor so we can see what's going on. And then finally, right at the very bottom of the loop, this is actually the, the, the crucial line of code, which is going to release the key that the players want. We're going to write a signal to the relay pin. And the signal that we're going to write, or the value, sorry, that we're going to write, is equal to the variable all correct. So if all correct is true, we're going to write a high signal to the relay pin. And if all correct is false, we're going to write a low signal to the relay pin. And that is going to be responsible for uh, energizing or de-energizing the maglock, which is going to release the key. Um, and that's literally it. So that just about brings me to the end of this video. And I hope you found it useful or interesting or informative. I've really enjoyed making it and being able to show you some of the other software tools I use, not just writing Arduino code, but also using Inkscape for graphic design and layouts, and using MiniZinc for testing puzzle logic. And I hope you found that interesting too. As always, I will copy up the code and the diagrams and the wiring which I've used over onto my Patreon account. I'm only able to make these videos with the very generous support of my Patreon donors, so I want to say thank you all ever so much indeed. I really appreciate it. And if you're interested in checking out uh, this Escape Room project or any of the other projects I've made on this channel, do please go over and check out my Patreon. I'll put a link in the description below. Um, otherwise, if you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please do write them uh, in the comments below and I'll do my best to get back to you. Um, otherwise, I just want to say thank you very much for watching and I look forward to seeing you next time. Okay, cheers. Bye.